Welcome everybody to the last session of the Monk School Queens International Institute on Social Policy 2022. I'm Naomi Alboin, a distinguished fellow at the School of Policy Studies at Queens University. And I'm also on the Small But Mighty Organizing Committee of MQIISP. To begin with, as part of our efforts on recognition and reconciliation, I would like to acknowledge that Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory, while the University of Toronto is situated on the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississauga of the credit. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live and learn on these lands and recognize our obligation to care for the land that we all share. For over 25 years, the Queen's International Institute has brought together researchers, policymakers, community leaders, and service providers to discuss the most pressing social policy challenges facing Canada and other OECD countries. This year, Queen's University and the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy joined forces to host an ambitious program focused on whether and how we need to reform or even transform Canadian social policy for a more resilient and successful future. The 2022 Institute launched on October 31st at a day long conference at the Monk School and choices facing Canada and other OECD countries, socioeconomic, cultural, generational, and political. Today's session is on the public and political landscape, prospects for the future of social policy. And it follows a series of eight virtual policy seminars, which have drilled down into major areas of social policy that are most in flux and ripe for rethinking. In the past three weeks, we have focused on the labor market, income protection, immigration, the care economy, community and housing, healthcare, mental health, and disability. All sessions are being recorded and posted on the Monk School's MQISP conference website. I really encourage you to check out the sessions you have missed. They have been terrific. Today, we are asking our panelists to address the issues that may either facilitate or inhibit the likelihood of the positive changes and innovations in social policy that we've been speaking about. What does the public or publics what do the publics think? And what will encourage governments to respond to the challenges we face? As in all the sessions, we really encourage you to write your questions in the Q&A box as they occur to you. The moderator will be scanning them throughout today's session, and we hope to get to as many of your questions as possible. A great pleasure to introduce our moderator for this session, Nathalie Desrosiers. Nathalie Desrosiers is the principal of Massey College, professor at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law, and a senior fellow at Trinity College. From 2016 to 2019, she was the member of the Ontario Provincial Parliament representing the riding of Ottawa Vanier and was Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Natalie was Dean of Law at the University of Ottawa, General Counsel of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, and President of the Law Commission of Canada. She has written extensively on the Canadian Constitution, civil liberties, human rights, and law reform, focusing her work on the right to protest and freedom of expression. Her early work on limitations of action for sexual violence changed Canadian law in the 1990s. She has received the Order of Canada, the Order of Ontario, honorary doctorates from the Université UCL in Belgium and the Law Society of Ontario, Le Prix Christine Tourigny from the Quebec Gare, and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Over to you, Nathalie. 
Uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to participate in this fabulous series. So important uh, as we address what's next, what should we do next? And today it's particularly interesting to, to look at where's the public at and what can we do? What do we need to know about where the public understands these issues to see what will allow government to proceed and what will be the challenges that they will face as they try to address the big issues of social policies that need to be uh, addressed and transformed as we discussed for the last uh, few weeks. So let me uh, introduce our two speakers today. We're very fortunate to have uh, two persons that have kind of managed and understood the way in which the public thinks, the way politicians uh, think as well. And I think we'll start uh, a great conversation. First, uh, Carol Doherty is the Director of Political Research at the Pew Research Center. He's played a leading role in developing that center's research agenda and really is at the center of understanding U.S. views on policy issues and priorities and political knowledge and news interest. He's provided analysis of public opinion and politics for domestic and international news outlet, NPR, CNBC, and the BBC. And he also speaks to government, academic, and business groups on all of these topics. Before joining a Pew Research in, uh, Center in 2000, he worked as a journalist for many years, covering congregational leadership, politics, and foreign affairs as a senior writer for Congressional Quarterly and serving as an investigative reporter for CBS News on foreign affairs. He holds a master's degree in international studies at the, from John Hopkins University and a bachelor in political science from Loyola University in Maryland. After him, we'll hear from Bruce Anderson, who uh, we all know in Canada, Canada's most respected opinion researcher and strategic communications advisor. He was, uh, in 1980, he was a special assistant to the federal minister responsible for government communications. In 1983, he joined uh, the CIMA research. He was appointed president in 1989. And then after that, I think I'll go quickly through his long career here, became chairman in 2013 of Abacus Dada, one of Canada's fastest growing research company. He, founded two advertising agencies, including Spark Advocacy, which is a leader in Canada's public affairs campaigns. He advises everyone, <laughs> uh, corporate clients, as well as industry association, and has done lots of years of in-depth polling on politics and public uh, policy. He advises leaders, both from the liberal and the conservative uh, uh, side, really someone that we've uh, seen often giving advice and being present in the Canadian media. We're so happy to have you both here uh, to enlighten us on where's the public and what politicians can do about this, uh, these difficult questions facing our respective countries. Carol, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's, it's really great to be here. And uh will begin my presentation. I hope you all can see that. You can, Natalie, is that coming up? Hold on. Yes. Stand a little bit. There, that's better. Okay. And now I wanted to explain a little bit about, uh, hold on, I'm moving a little faster about who we are, the Pew Research Center is a nonpartisan, we don't take positions. Uh, we, we uh, as you can see, we generate a foundation of facts to enrich the public dialogue. For me, that means uh, political research and we do political analysis, data analysis, public opinion, and everything is available on our website. It's, um, it's great work and I have a lot of fun doing it, but it's been a bit, little bit busy uh, the last week or two. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd like to get right into the, we were talking about uh, trust and trust in government. And this is, this is one of the more famous uh, 
uh, charts in, in political science in the United States, it's, uh, it shows the, the long decline of trust in the federal government. As you can see, in the 1960s and 70s, most Americans did have a good bit of tr trust in their federal government. And then that declined through the period of the Vietnam War and Watergate and the stagflation of the early 1980s. And you see it coming back a little bit during the Reagan era. And that one spike you see there where the 54% is saying they could trust the government to do what is right mostly or all the time. That came shortly after the 9-11 terrorist attacks, uh, when you may recall the, the, the United States really did come together in, a, in an unusually <laughs> united way after following those terrorist attacks. And that was not a lasting moment, uh, you know, for, for better than, you know, a decade and a half, it's been mired at a very low level, around 20% in our most reading, recent reading. And, uh, you know, there are a number of causes for this, you know, the, the, the country's gotten more polarized politically. Uh, certainly, uh, government performance is, is not widely viewed in a positive way in, in many areas, especially those areas that are, uh, get the most public scrutiny, the most media scrutiny. And uh, the transparency of government, I think, has been a factor as well, that people know more now than they did before, certainly in the 1960s or 70s, which is a good thing. On the other hand, they can see the government warts and all more clearly than ever. So um, in the, in, by party, you can see that, you know, this, this is Republicans, the, the, the red-blue is the Republicans and Democrats. Um, you know, it's gone down among members of both parties. Typically, the Democrats are a little bit higher when, they're, when their uh, president is in power, the Republicans a little bit higher, but the, the general trend is down. And, and um, you know, the, the events, again, of the 1970s and early 1980s were a big factor in starting this decline. It's never really recovered. On the other hand, you see more confidence in, in people's governments in their own state and local governments in the United States. And that's, that's an important point. Federal government seems distant and aloof to many Americans. On the other hand, their local government, two thirds or so, say they have a favorable view of that and, and a majority say the same about their state government. And this par partisan polarization you see is mostly uh, on the federal government level. This is not uh, something that happens as much on the state and local level. Um, which is an encouraging sign. I think you know you, the, the, most of the most of the paralysis caused by uh, polarization is occurring at the federal level. You know, one of the things that I wanted to go over some branches of government. The, you know, the Supreme Court has been in the news in the United States for the past year with its abortion decision, and this has had a dramatic effect on on people's views of the Supreme Court. This is among our, the current reading, only about half saying they have a favorable opinion of the court is the lowest we've seen in, in, in 30 years. Um, again, very polarized views. Uh, you know, Democrats now at their lowest, by far positive views of the Supreme Court in, in going back to the 1980s. And this is what's happened in institution after institution in the United States. You see this polarization, especially here, where the court was traditionally seen as above politics, and now it's very much seen as a political institution in a way that it's never been before. And that's had an effect on, on its public image. And Congress, of course, remains in low, low esteem. Uh, among the public, this is taken before the midterms, but I, I can't imagine that anything that occurred in, in the elections will do much to raise the esteem of Congress. And, and in some ways, this goes with the territory in America where, you know, it's, it's your right as an American to, to criticize Congress, criticize your lawmaker. But as you can see, it wasn't always the case. On the other hand, the idea of compromise in politics, no matter how you measure this, there is a desire uh, for compromise. It, it, you know, we've, we've studied this issue in different ways and 
normally if you just propose the abstract uh, concept of compromise people oh sure that sounds pretty good we tried to make it a little tougher um you know it's it's selling out on what you believe in um even when you say that it's selling out your own principles pe most people want compromise in politics they understand that in order for things to get done uh, the two parties need to compromise and the the government does while well, the public doesn't have a great deal of trust in government, it sees an important role for government in most areas or many areas, I should say. This is a whole list of of uh, areas where the the government uh, is seen as having responsibility. You know, be on the environment, on education, on on health, on retirement income. Over and over, majorities say the government should uh, play that role, and in some cases. Uh, the, the, the public gives the government high marks, but not in these contentious areas that have emerged, uh, the ones that are most prominent in political campaigns and things like that, particularly something like health insurance, which was so controversial during the Obama era, era when he was expanding the, the, America, the, the expanding health insurance for Americans. And even the, the employees, you know, this is an interesting thing. We've done a lot of studies of government. And for the most part, the, the, the career employees were seen as a little bit above the fray too, but not so much anymore. You know, only about half saying they have a, a good bit of confidence in the, in the career employees. Of course, much less confidence um, in the political appointees, not surprising there, given the fact that you know, this is this is one side, one party's appointees. But let's put this into some international perspective now. Uh, you know, we don't we have a we also have a global uh, research group that does a lot of this work, and I'm I'm borrowing uh, some slides from them. It's very interesting. I mean, this desire for political reform is not limited to the United States. Uh, it, you can see it in a lot of a, a lot of Western European countries, countries all over the world. Do their do their political systems need to be completely reformed or major changes? Majorities in many countries uh, say that. You'll see down uh, at at the bottom of this chart, Canada is is not one of those countries. Uh, the, this was this was done a year ago, but fewer than half in Canada said that the, the, the political system needed major changes. That's the lowest of the many of the, these countries that were surveyed right next to New Zealand. Um, the U.S. Is, is close to the top, but not at the top. Like for, for many countries, there's a desire for real uh, sweeping political change. And um, and that's that's true in the United States. No matter how we measure it, there's a desire for political change. Now, when you ask Republicans and Democrats what kinds of changes they'd like to see, they differ differ markedly about that. But there is an agreement about that things need to change. And this shows the cynicism of the public when it comes to government. I mean, it's really extraordinary the degree to which Americans. You know, this statement, most politicians are corrupt, describes our country well. 67% of the United States say that, much, much higher than uh, other, other uh, OECD countries you see here. And 56% and say elected officials care what ordinary people think does not describe their country well. And so it, it, there's, a, there's a real cynicism here. And I think that cynicism has a lot of downstream effects, including some of the political turmoil and the, and the rise of Donald Trump and things like that, because if people think the, the system is being gamed, it's, it's sort of like, what do you have to lose in, for some voters saying, why not take a chance on somebody who's totally out in the system, such as Trump? On the other hand, there's support for these basic tenets of democracy, and this goes across many countries. I mean, this just shows the U.S. and U.K., but, you know, the, these are not in contention. The, the, the goals the public has for government and the political system are really not controversial. People agree there should be a fair judiciary, free religion, freedom of speech, etc. You see Russia there as a contrast. Again, this is a couple of years old, but uh, Russia certainly uh, takes a different view of these these uh, freedoms that uh, people in the in the you know Western countries take for granted. 
you know, and and the you know the support for regularly, you know, this may seem like a low bar, but but broadly supportive of people around the world, broadly supportive of a of, of fair, honest elections with choices of at least two political parties, nearly identical shares in the, the U.S. and Canada say this. Large majorities elsewhere say this. Um, not so much in, in Russia, and this was Ukraine again a couple of years before the, the, the Russian invasion. Uh, but um, you know, less support for this this basic democratic principle there. And finally, uh, you know, that you, the, at least in spite of the cynicism of that Americans have about their government, they do believe that voting gives them a say about how government runs things and, the, and the, their, their views there are virtually identical to Canadians' views. And, um, you know, it's very interesting because the one thing that we've seen, you know, there's, there's a lot that's wrong with, with, with American politics these days, but one of the good things or positive things that we've seen in recent years is that each each succeeding election since 2018, 2018 was a very high turnout election. 2020, one of the highest turnouts for a presidential election. And I think when all the votes are counted in 2022, we're going to see a very high uh, share of a uh, very high vote in America for the midterm elections. They typically it's typically lower for a congressional election than for a presidential election, but nonetheless. This is a this is a trend that uh, it seems pretty well established now that people are turning out uh, at higher rates than in the past, even say 2014, 2012. So this is something that's that's really been increasing. And with that, I will uh, have our website up there, and and you can see that. But I will stop sharing and turn it over to Bruce. Thank you very much, um, Carol. The, um, the work that Pew does is work that I uh, very much admire and I consume it um, a lot over the years. It's been uh, very, very helpful to me in, in my work. Um, and some of the numbers that you showed uh, just now are numbers that I've been kind of paying attention to. I, I'm afraid that um, you kind of uh, presented a somewhat more optimistic interpretation of uh, of the way things are than than I have to offer today. I was sort of looking at the stuff that I prepared and felt it was a bit dystopian. Um, and uh, I don't like to be that way, but it's not a great time in the history of our country. And, and probably I would say the same thing about yours. Um, and the maybe one of the best pieces of uh, one of the best ways to kind of understand that the different ways that we can interpret those things is I saw the same number in your Canada data as in the US data as about 16 or 17 percent who basically are for fascism or not for democracy, if I can put it that way. And uh, we find that size of that segment an increasingly troublesome uh, factor in terms of its influence on principally conservative uh, politics in Canada. And it's, um, it's bigger and more forceful uh, as a political um, um, phenomena than it ever has been here. Uh, but let me uh, talk about what it is that I wanted to share a little bit less on the data, a little bit more on the kind of the larger trends that, that the data help illustrate. And I've called my presentation the me times because the probably the most important shift that I've seen um, in all of the data that I look at in Canada, almost going back to the not long after the post the initial post-war period, um, there was a pretty strong sense of collectivism in Canada. Uh, and over the last uh, several decades, that's been slowly uh, kind of grinding down in the last decade or so. Uh, there's, there's more evidence of people thinking first about themselves, nothing necessarily wrong with that, but also not believing as strongly as they used to that collective action and the collective interest can uh, help everybody. Um, and of course, when we have um, politicians who decide to try to make a meal of that politically, uh, then those tensions become exacerbated and the problems grow bigger. Um, so let me walk through a few of the things that we've been paying a lot of attention to in our research and that have kind of made me a little bit more anxious about the future uh, than I would have been at any time in my career in the past. 
we see the tension between uh, those who believe public policy should be made on the basis of evidence and those whose uh, natural setting seems to be suspicion of evidence right now. We know that almost half of Canadians say that much of the information we receive from news organizations is false today, and the half believe that official government accounts of events can't be trusted. They're, you know, relatively small percentages, but actually significant numbers of people who believe that 9-11 was an inside job, that humans have never landed on the moon, that the Trump election was stolen from him, that climate change is a hoax. We have 4 million adult Canadians who think that Bill Gates has put chips in them to control their behavior. Um, now, I don't know because we never measured it before because it never made sense to measure it before what those numbers would have been like 10 years ago. But these phenomena, these attitudes definitely travel the internet more aggressively and have a more pernicious effect on the nature of the debate about public policy, whether or not we're talking about um, the usefulness of vaccines or masks or what's causing COVID or where it came from. And in a way, that pandemic really brought to light uh, the huge risk uh, to the functioning of our democracy caused by uh, the phenomena that I'm describing here. Um, the other kind of sibling to that has been the rise of uh, polarization, and in particular, that aspect of polarization that stems from um, what I think Scott Galloway has, has really aptly described as this economic coupling in his work, you're probably familiar with it, probably everybody on the call is, he describes around 1973, a breaking of the pattern where the income for the wealthiest and the income for everybody else was tracking pretty closely together. And all of a sudden, the lines really started to diverge. And uh, he doesn't say sort of lay all of the polarization at the feet of that aspect of what's gone on. But um, when I look at the various uh, dynamics, it does feel to me that in the last 10 years or so, we've seen an increasing uh, effort by some politicians to um, argue that if you feel like you're being left behind, and there's no question large numbers of people in Canada and the U.S. are being left behind, that, um, that there are people that you can blame for that uh, and policies that you can blame for that. And um, that's been a very attractive uh, set of political themes. It has been, I think, a large part of the, um, the engineering of, uh, of Trumpism in the United States and the People's Party in Canada. And it is it has contributed to a higher degree of zero sum thinking around public policy that I've seen before. There was a tendency in Canada. Canada is two thirds progressive, one third conservative, but even the one third conservative is usually pretty progressive conservative. But we now have more people than we ever have who say, if somebody's going to get a benefit that didn't exist before from some government policy that might come at my expense. And that is a real challenge, I think, that exists in a higher, uh, at a higher level than it has in the past because the personal and the collective interests are no longer seen as being as synonymous or as mutually uh, supportive as was the case in the past. The public square is also something that's changed really dramatically in the last uh, 15, 20 years with the advent of technology and, and the new platforms that people are using to consume news and information and share points of view. What we've seen is a movement away from the use of uh, traditional now called legacy media, which is kind of the polite word for media that don't matter very much anymore. And the trust that has been placed in the guardrail functions of legacy media in some of the more senior voices who study issues and uh, opine on them, all of that has been breaking down and the acceleration of that breakdown um, well, I mean, today is probably a pretty good uh, case in point where people are wondering, uh, millions of people who, not, not everybody uses Twitter, but millions of people are using Twitter, are wondering if that platform is breaking down under its own weight because of the coarsening and the dividing that these uh, social platforms seem to be uh, helping accelerate within society. 
Where we may end up is that there is no common platform. We're probably there already in terms of the sharing of information that can help produce informed consensus choices. We're also seeing, obviously, a, a blurring of the lines, um, very pronounced blurring of the lines between fact and fiction. And uh, I don't think that I, there are ways for government to solve that in the near term. I think that choices of regulating the internet are ugly and uglier in terms of the policy mechanisms that might be available, but doing nothing is definitely pointing us in a direction where more people will be confused about what choices make sense for them uh, by the political entities and the politicians that uh, they choose at election times. And that obviously is a major risk for democracy. We've seen increasing challenges to the idea of the rule of law, including uh, maybe surprisingly, from the conservative side of the spectrum. Um, fewer conservatives standing up and saying a law is a law and it must be obeyed. More small c conservative further right on the spectrum for sure, uh, saying things that sound like uh, what the US experienced on January 6th and we did with the Freedom Convoy in, in Ottawa, this idea of vigilantism being uh, patriotism, basically, that it is something to be admired uh, when the state has turned into something tyrannical. Uh, I wouldn't have thought 10 years ago I'd ever be saying the words that I'm saying uh, right now. Why is it happening? Disinformation is winning. Um, organizations that are promoting disinformation, whether inside our country or from outside our country, are faster to organize, faster to act, find it easier to fundraise, and don't, have, don't follow any rules or protocols or any of the uh, of the niceties uh, that that uh, shape the activities of other stakeholders in society, we're seeing a war against the idea of woke. And for those on the call and the, in the webinar, whose role it is to promote social progress and social policies that affect uh, social progress, this is a very very significant issue. What we see is that the more ideas that come forward that promote equal rights for groups in society that haven't really enjoyed equal rights, the bigger the pushback, the bigger the backlash, and the sense that politics, conservative politics, could perhaps be more successful the more it attacks ideas that fall into that progressive landscape and attack them by calling them, by labeling them something that uh, uh, that is meant to be derogatory, even though obviously the origin of the term woke uh, isn't inherently uh, derogatory, quite the contrary. Um, I've also noticed uh, an intra, uh, you know, a, a movement towards the idea that complex policy issues shouldn't necessarily be things that we compromise on but are better presented as binary. Um, Brexit or remain rather than fix it um, is a good example of how politics sort of took a complex issue and decided it was better to treat it as though it was simple and that there were two equally bad choices, but you had to pick one of those equally uh, bad choices rather than find a solution that required politicians to convince people that putting some water in their wine was better than winning a fight with people with whom they appeared to disagree. We've seen the triumph of the simple sounding political argument over the complex solution to a complex problem. It's enabled by weaker literacy about public policy and how our economy and how our society work than I've ever seen. So we have this paradox of more highly educated people consuming lots and lots of information 24 7 365 but the information that they're consuming is not creating a higher degree of understanding of what the policy mix is that is in their interests um, and the last point here is the attention spans are shorter and shorter and shorter so in a lot of the campaigns that we work on for example we're trying to get people to engage on a complex policy issue we know that we have to attract their attention with something like 12 words, not 700, and a little bit of moving image rather than a complex policy paper. And that's the way to get the conversation started because anything else doesn't seem to work 
uh, in today's environment, given the attention spans and the distraction effects that we see in society. I'm almost finished all of the dystopian uh, <laughs> stuff that I have to say. Um, I saw that in your earlier conversations, mental health uh, has been a subject. And I wanted to say that of the phenomena that I've seen in the public opinion that has been most shocking to me in the last several years, it has been the rise in the number of people who say in our surveys, and I would imagine that these people, that these numbers are understating uh, because of a social desirability bias, who say that they've been accessing mental health services, who are feeling burned out, who are feeling less happy because they're feeling burned out. Uh, this sense of burnout, particularly acute among people under 30, particularly acute among women under 30, uh, is, is coincident with uh, a rising mistrust of other people, a sense of vulnerability and anxiety. And our healthcare system is, um, is under a lot of strains, um, including around emergent health right now, but this has been a bigger growth in terms of uh, a pain point for more people who have been trying to access these services uh, over the last five or, or six years and who find um, the services aren't available or aren't affordable. Um, all of that kind of sits alongside the economy cost of living issue, which is the number one issue in the country. 40% of Canadians are feeling a pinch. Right now, though, this isn't a classic kind of economic election scenario if there was going to be an election, in part because people do know that this is a phenomenon that's happening in other parts of the world as well, and they're not sure exactly what, if anything, can be done except to try to gut it out, to grind it out, to get through it, and to hope for a better and more uh, tranquil and predictable economic time going forward. But that's more hope than confidence, is what I would say right now. On climate change, the mood in the country uh, is really for continued action with less friction. Voters, including in Alberta and Saskatchewan, for the most part, especially in the urban parts of those provinces, don't want elections around uh, should we take action on climate change. They want continued action. Uh, I think opponents uh, of action basically focus on uh, ideas that seem impractical or too expensive rather than climate change is a hoax or um, uh, it's not our moral responsibility. And the proponents all see a moral imperative and they do increasingly see an economic upside. So less controversy and less friction around that issue is what I see. On housing, looks like a big issue in Canada. There are really two issues. The unhoused who are in crisis, especially because our cities have become a less uh, amenable uh, to supporting them with social services that they need. And then also the cost of housing for uh, relatively uh, affluent uh, uh, individuals and families in our major urban centers. It's not happening only in Canada, obviously, but it is a bigger factor in Canada than we've ever seen before, particularly pernicious in the greater Vancouver and greater Toronto area, where as we uh, aimed towards 400,000 or almost 500,000 immigrants every year. We know so many of those people go to those cities. We need to find something uh, that solves for that problem. And I think the best ideas that I've been hearing are looking at the landmass in Canada, looking at the places where more communities could grow and thrive along the St. Lawrence Seaway, for example, or the Fraser River Valley and finding ways to incentivize people to locate there, especially viable, I think, in the world where uh, virtual work or remote work is, is available. I don't think I'll get into the political data. I just wanted to say that to, right now, our electoral situation is, um, is not terribly divided. I mean, I think we've, we've, we've seen situations where it felt more partisan than it does right now. If we look at the situation of the Liberal Party, um, this is what happened in the last three elections. They got 39, then 33, then 33 percent of the vote. Uh, and through the last year or so, their numbers have been kind of tracking in that general area. No significant change. They're in a place where they could win an election with those numbers, but probably don't feel very confident about it. The principal opponent, Conservative Party, this is what it looked like in, third, in the election in 2015, 2019, 
2021. You saw, see the seat increase there with a marginal increase in the share of popular vote. And this is what their numbers have been looking like in the last little bit. An upswing generally, numbers that don't tell them that they would win an election right now, but give them more reason for optimism perhaps than they've seen before. So let me close with this. I think the geopolitical shifts, not just in Canada, are creating new risks and greater anxieties. People don't know what the future will hold when it comes to climate change, nor with conflict in the world. Russia is not the Russia that it used to be. China is not the China that it used to be. And um, the United States is clearly, for many people, more of a question mark in terms of the strength of the economic uh, alliance, the strength of the military alliance, not so much when Democrats are in office, but as people think about what Republican government might look like there. Technology is destroying a lot of the guardrails, creating a lot of harm alongside the benefits that it brings, harm in the sense of social cohesion and democratic functioning. It's harder to build and hold consensus around public policy than it ever has been in the 40 years that I've been kind of in this business. Uh, why is that? The collective lens is clouded. People don't really know what is in their collective interest to the degree that they did before, and it's easier for them to be drawn into supporting ideas that are zero-sum game. I need to get something, somebody needs to get um, something less as a consequence of that. Better educated, less knowledgeable, and therefore, all of that says activism on social issues is at an inflection point. Continuing to activate, to do activism on environmental or social issues in the way that seemed to work for the last 25 years probably won't work as well going forward, but it's hard to see what should replace it. And um, with that, I'll stop and hopefully people will have more optimistic sounding things to, uh, to say than I just did, but thank you for asking me to uh, participate. Yes, well, thank you both for uh, enlightening us so well. Let me start by just uh, two uh, two questions uh, to each of you, and and then move to uh, some of the good questions that are coming up uh, on the screen here in front of me. Uh, first, uh, Bruce, on uh, at this very optimistic look at Canada that you presented here, uh, I was surprised actually. On um, it seemed to me that you. Uh, there was some form of consensus around climate change that you seem to identify. Can you uh, pinpoint when it occurred or whether indeed strong action on climate change kind of brought people along uh, and diminished the opposition? Or is it that it came from outside of, of uh, Canadian uh, policy impetus? Well, I think the sense of environmental um, stewardship has always been pretty strong in the country. Um, and I, so as a starting point, perhaps a difference vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States, the idea that this is a big, kind of fairly pristine country uh, was, it was a relatively good starting point. I think the idea of agreeing with other nations who are seeing pernicious effects of climate change and trying to do something in the global collective also lands more easily in the Canadian social political context, at least the history of how we've seen our role in the international context. Uh, but some of the more um, uh, propelling factors in recent years have been the floods, the fires, uh, the smoke. Um, mm -hmm. And against that, the pushback um, in Canada has been principally a pushback that says, we just need to use fossil fuels more because it's good for our economy. Mm -hmm. And as long as that was the counterpoint, uh, it wasn't going to work very well mm -hmm. uh, because people wanted to see alternatives. They wanted to understand what was being tried to reduce emissions in fossil fuel production. Whereas I think politics in the United States uh, is much more robust uh, energy independence, uh, independence from uh, Middle Eastern oil, all of that, the politics of that was more highly charged and more equally balanced with the environmentalism, whereas here that balance isn't even close to 50-50 and, and it never really was. So I think weather events and the dynamic between oil producers and everybody else has been quite different. 
And to Carol, I, I was struck in your presentation how there was more trust at local government and and even on states. And that surprised me a little bit in a sense that we tend to view probably the distrust or the, or the polarization in, in Canada, in the US uh, with along big trends that uh, Bruce mentioned as well. The, the trends that are not, that we don't differentiate between the local and, and, and the, the national government when people just have clouded uh, a, a ability to understand what's going on or filled with disinformation and so on. How do you explain that uh, there's still some form of trust at, at state and local governments? It, it's an interesting phenomenon in the federal system in the United States. Uh, you know, the federal government historically has been seen very far away from a lot of Americans and their local governments obviously much closer. I think you're starting to see now uh, some of the same polarization at the local level. You don't see it in the data so much, but certainly uh, around education in the United States, uh, which is essentially a local issue. Um, you know, there is federal funding, but it's, a, it's, it's run at the local level you see this polarization around school boards and things like that and, and addressing some of the cultural issues that Bruce mentioned. So it's starting to creep in. I mean, historically it hasn't been there, this sort of, you know, I mean, among other things, you know, state governments have to, have to get things done. Many state governments have, are required to balance their budgets. It's not a question. They are required to do it, whereas the federal government can can run deficits endlessly. And, and so it, it's, there, there's, a, there's a different philosophy and a different structure there. But as I said, I think you're seeing some of the polarization and gridlock that, that we've seen at the federal level creep into local politics, local governance as well. Just to follow up one question that came on the, uh, on the line here. Uh, it's a question from uh, Joanna Plater. It says, 67, with 67% of Americans saying American politicians are corrupt, uh, do you think one of the reasons is structural, the role of money, donation, the facts, um, and the way in also is the political process, which involved in the selection, election of the judiciary at various levels, uh, and the electoral cycle every two years, uh, does that mm -hmm explain why there's such a widespread belief that politicians are corrupt? I think the money, I think it, it never gets the adequate attention it deserves by the media. I mean, I think they do a good job, news organizations, the major ones do a good job of, of covering money and politics. But it's a it's a major issue for Americans. They see what's going on, and and uh, you know these unlimited funds that, that flow into campaigns. It, it it is it is something that that resonates all the time in surveys we conduct. That that money in politics is a real problem, and it's a real and it's a bipartisan. You know the, the Republicans and Democrats don't necessarily disagree about this, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it, you know we had an issue uh, relatively minor issue at the end of the Congress, the, 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 this current Congress that's ending, uh, about, um, you know, a, a bill that would prevent lawmakers from doing stock trades, you know, because of inside information that they have, and it's got stalled. And that's another example of, of something that you know, could restore the public trust, probably not a great deal, but a little bit, and, and these things it's just an accumulation of issues like that where they see a lot of corruption. On the on the frequency of elections, certainly a lot of elections um, in the United States. Some some political scientists maybe say that there are too many, and and I think a bigger issue is the fact that we're already, unfortunately, talking about 2024 in the United States. It's as if. As soon as the midterm elections ended, we were talking about Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis and Joe Biden, and 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 and, and that that is somewhat the fault of the news media in the sense of of revving up this campaign interest. We sh we should we should worry a little bit more about governance and a little less about politics. Uh, I think, if in in that sense. 
It's good, but I have two questions here that I actually I'll join together that are about changing demographics. Um, so first of all, I think uh, one question I think, and I, I'll ask both of you to reflect on that uh, if you if you may. Um, uh, obviously, the the boomer generation is uh, going away, is eventually on its way out, and uh, the generation Z seems to be uh, more progressive. Uh, so, to Bruce, does that will that change uh, conservatism in Canada? And also, um, uh, there's another question about is uh, what will be the impact of young people in the in the U.S. elections? Is uh, increasing diversity also a factor in managing the, the political landscape? Uh, let me start with you, Carol, and then I'll go to Bruce. Well, I think it's I think the, the demographic change can get a little bit overstated in the United States. I do certainly Generation Z young people take a more liberal view on many issues, particularly climate change. Uh, you know, this is this is one where they really stand out. Um, and they vote at much lower levels than do older people uh, in the United States. The, the, we're still sifting through the data for the, the congressional election. We'll have a major report out next summer covering the whole thing. Uh, but it looks like young people turned out at a fairly high level, but still lower than, than older people. Um, you know, so the, the, they 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 punch below their weight politically. They they don't exert as much influence over politics and governance as they could. Uh, seriously, the, the the young people. On demographics, uh, it, it's it's interesting. I mean, one of the trends in the in the congressional elections was was people watching the the Latino vote, and and it has been trending a little bit. Republican. There was a, in our data it shows an eight point gain for Donald Trump between uh, 2016 and 2020 presidential election among Latinos, suggesting this idea that Democrat that demographics as destiny is not not really true. I think and I and but you know I do think the demographic changes broadly in the United States will, will probably lead to more progressive. Uh, uh, outcomes, but it's not a straight line. It, it's it's anything but, and 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 politicians of both parties still have to compete to win votes and can't assume any demographic group will vote for them uh, just because they have in the past. What about you, Bruce? Demographic change in Canada and and uh, the the fate of the conservative conservatism in Canada. You know, it's quite different. Um, uh, I was really interested in what Carol was saying, and, and um, we don't have a big generation gap in Canada around climate change. In fact, for uh, many years, older people, baby boomers, were feeling more um, not just uh, anxiety about it, but guilt about uh, whether they were doing enough, having participated in the in the lifestyles that created the problem, even if unknowingly, um, older people were more anxious uh, about the need to do things um, that they could do um, sooner rather than later. Um, so we don't see a big uh, generation gap there. We do see a big generation gap on the housing question. Uh, and it's not driven by old people saying, I don't want young people to be able to have houses. It's, it's that if you own a house, you see the increasing value of that house as a as an economic upside rather than as a, as an economic problem. So we will have increasing divergence demographically around that. That will create more tensions in our big cities. Um, but the way that that tension is being resolved right now is that in many of our big cities, we are seeing the election of progressive governments. You asked the question earlier about the remoteness of the federal government and the, how people feel differently about the, the local governments. In our work, we, we think that if people are disaffected with the federal governments because they think that the government's kind of wasting their money or doing things that aren't beneficial for them, where they look at local government, they go, I need them to do certain things for me. And so I'm going to pick people who sound like they know the things that I care about the most. And so even in the most conservative province, Alberta, we've got two progressive mayors in the two big cities. Um, and if you look across the country, that really has been uh, a growing pattern. 
it kind of underscores the fact that most voters are what I would call a progressive and libertarian, but libertarian in the sense of not, I don't want government involvement in my life, but libertarian in the sense of I want everybody to live the life that they want to live. Um, and that's other big difference that I wanted to just uh, finish on between Canada and the United States. Canada, uh, you know, the United States obviously has a, has a long-standing issue associated with race or multiple issues associated with race. We don't have the same phenomena. We have 20% of Canadians are racist. I guess it's probably, if I'm going to be really blunt, that's, that's the number that I see in our data. But that isn't uh, about uh, African Canadians and white Canadians. That 20% who I would characterize as racist are also homophobic, misogynist. Um, and so when you look at those things, it really looks as though it's a cluster of people who believe that um, their rights are somehow diminished by the increasing rights of, of uh, minority certain minority communities that didn't always have those have those rights. Um, at 20%, it's big enough to be influential, especially in the conservative party politics and conservative politics. But it won't really grow. The question is whether or not it will um, have much energy within a conservative party that might form a government or it will be marginalized, even though it's bigger. I think than it was probably 15 or 20 years ago, and it's more actively recruited and nurtured uh, by some of the forces that we see on the internet and some of the politicians uh, on the fringes of the spectrum here. That brings me to another question that uh, has been asked about the rural uh, urban divide and whether or not uh, that's a significant part of what's happening in Canada or in the US and, and whether politicians can bridge that or not. Uh, let's start with you, Bruce. I, I think it's a big problem in Alberta. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see it as being that big a problem in the rest of the country. And part of it, I, I think, is that the, um, uh, well, we're so urbanized and increasingly urbanized. If I look at the patterns of opinion in British Columbia, for example, and how much urbanization has happened over the last 40 years, um, yeah, there's some tensions around extractive sector issues, forestry, gas, LNG, that sort of thing. But they're mostly around um, incorporating uh, sustainability or net zero uh, agendas and indigenous reconciliation. They're not uh, urban rural in the sense of rural people feeling as though the direction of the province is completely inconsistent with their values. Um, in Alberta, there's no question that the people in the two biggest cities don't see the future of the world or their province the same way as a lot of voters in rural Alberta. And the same is true, I, I suppose, in, in Saskatchewan. But we don't, I, I don't see that problem uh, being very pernicious in other parts of the country. Carol? Uh... No, along with the educational divide, you know, there are several, you know, kind of divisions in American politics that are important. Um, obviously, demographic divisions have been have existed for many years. What's most interesting now is is the educational divide, the, the divide between those Americans who have you know, college degrees and those who don't. That's one of the biggest divisions in American politics. And as I mean, Donald Trump put it kind of crudely, but you know, the the, the, the I love the less educated. That was his his campaign lines in 2016, and they love him back. Uh, he does much better among those voters who, who don't have college degrees. And in some ways, that's connected to the urban-rural divide, that, that you know, this is another gap that's been growing. Democrats really don't succeed very often in rural areas, and, and Republicans don't do well in urban areas. And there's been what's called, the, the, in a book 20 years ago by a journalist named Bill Bishop, called the big sort, Democrats more or less collecting in the big cities along the east and west coasts and, and leaving 
a lot of that area in the middle to, to Republicans and, and with, the, with the structural system in the United States, they, ha they do have a disproportionate power. Uh, mm -hmm. These, you know, a state like Idaho or Wyoming, not populous, have two mm -hmm. senators in the same way that California does. And so, uh, so the urban-rural divide is, is, is really affecting American politics in a major way. Uh, Natalie, can I just add something on that? I, yes. You know, I'm thinking about a little bit more. The, if we take some of the issues that typically, as I consume American politics, and, and Carol, hopefully, excuse me for any errors in this, um, the difference between the heartland and the, and the kind of the coastal areas of public opinion, rural versus urban, if you want to think about it that way, you can see big differences on issues of um, social uh, norms, right? Same-sex marriage, uh, abortion, um, issues like climate change perhaps as well. Um, in Canada, we really don't see as much of that. There's some of it, but rural Canadians are not generally more likely to say, I don't care about climate change. Uh, or I'm dead set against the legalization of cannabis, or why did we legalize same-sex marriage, or should we do Indigenous reconciliation? Um, those things are largely settled and not terribly polarizing between rural and urban settings. Whereas I think in the U.S. political culture, maybe because of the fact that they have been this kind of bipartisan, constantly looking for things to be against that the other party is for, if I can put it that way. We don't have as much history of that kind of partisanship. Um, we may be headed uh, towards it. Maybe the last few elections have felt more like it, but it, it hasn't really been the way that our, our, our body politic has evolved so far. Well, we're coming to the end of our hour and I could see how we will want to continue to get, dig in, I think, in the demographics of, that can help us understand better how government will react to the challenges of transforming uh, social policy in the, in, in the future. So I wanna thank you both uh, for being uh, so helpful in understanding a little bit the layout, the lay of the land here in terms of where are the possible coalitions, if any. Uh, so I think I'll pass it back to uh, Naomi uh, and uh, thank you both. And I apologize. I think I tried to get as many questions in uh, from our list. Uh, hopefully, I think people uh, did um, want to have. Uh, oh, it looks like we may have another half hour for for more questions. Let me just kind of go back there to the the list here. Let me start here with the, with this one. Can you comment on the correlation, if any, between corporate lobbying? and the resulting deregulation and paring down of state and federal government in conjunction with movement between elected office and corporate board positions and decrease in trust in government. A little bit, I think, uh, Carol, you mentioned the role of money. Right. <laughs> and, uh, no, but maybe no, uh, uh, dig in a little bit more on the way in which uh, that uh, may affect uh, the distrust in government. It, it, it certainly breeds cynicism, uh, you know, and, and I think this cynicism is, is you know, uh, the trust in government, the, the low level of trust in government in the United States is, is very interesting because, you know, as long a trend as we have on that question, and it, and it goes back to the 1950s, 60s, um, we don't know what it looked like in the, in the beginning of the Republic. I suspect there was, you know, <laughs> United States was breaking away from from Britain. There was probably a lot of low trust in in the British government. So so maybe the U.S. in some ways was founded on a on a lack of trust in, in in government. So it has a long tradition in the U.S. On the other hand, I think the cynicism is is very dangerous. The cynicism about corruption because that is directly uh, fuels the rise of politicians like Donald Trump. Who, who, who not only says, I can fix it, he can say, well, as a billionaire, I'm not good, I'm incorruptible. The degree to which that, that appeal to voters, I think has been understated. I think, I think this idea that he is, you know, either, you know, so cynical himself that he can uh, figure out the system or he's incorruptible because he's so, so wealthy. 
all of that played into some of his appeal. And I just think this cynicism is, a, is an underrated factor in, in low confidence in government all, all the way around the idea that, that government is, is, people in government are out for themselves, out for the take. It's, it's, it's very pernicious. And of course, in Canada, the, the role of money and the, the appearance of money influencing politics is almost not even an issue at all. Um, you know, I think people are generally aware that um, huge amounts of money aren't spent on elections. And, um, and so people have a lot of criticisms of politicians, but corruption by money isn't anywhere near the top of the list. And I, I, I listening to Caroline, I know you, you write about this, but the notion that Americans would say, all politicians are corrupt or there's too much corruption. So let's elect Donald Trump is still one of the great mysteries of our time. <laughs> it, <really> is. <laughs> it sure is. Uh, let me go a little bit in, in one uh, interesting area that, that is raised here is if the, if part of the distrust in government came from the decoupling of income, that is that suddenly the rich became richer and the, the, the poor became poorer, or at least their growth uh, was nowhere near uh, the, the growth in the income of the rich. Why wouldn't social policy that would want to bring these, this coupling back, that would want to actually uh, reduce the decrepancy between the rich and the poor, why wouldn't that help <laughs> in, in uh, making sure that people are not as distrustful of, of government. Uh, let's start with Bruce and then Carol, if you have any comment, it'd be great as well. I think it does help. I actually think that some of the changes that we've seen in, in Canadian policy in the last few years has helped attenuate or make less severe um, the situation that was developing and has been developing in the United States. When I think of what has been happening in the United States, one of the major reasons why I think Trump was able to find and nurture this sense of economic grievance um, among less educated white males in particular is that um, there really weren't uh, solutions to that. Whereas, you know, lower cost childcare, the child benefit allowance, um, uh, you know, and I looked also at um, Carol's um, data that show how Republicans don't really believe that the federal government should have a role in income after retirement, should have a role in health care. Well, that's completely different from Canada, where people believe there is that safety net and should be that safety net. And that is not even a point of division, particularly between conservatives and liberals or progressives and, and conservatives. So uh, I, I think it would be a bigger problem here if we didn't have some of those policies. I think those kinds of policies are important to uh, attenuating further division. Um, but I think it's harder to see those policies be put in place in the United States uh, than it is in Canada. Yeah, the, the, the role of government, especially at the federal level, is so contentious. And this is not new. I mean, this, this libertarian streak in the Republican Party long predates Donald Trump or the current environment. And, and you know, certainly a lot of, you know, the, the, that chart that I showed in my presentation, a lot of Republicans are, are in effect conflicted. I mean, many older Republicans and Democrats alike enjoy the benefits of Social Security and Medicare programs, retirement programs in the United States. But there's a resistance to expand government, which we saw in the debate over Obamacare, and we see it on issue after issue today. There's just a resistance there for aid, doing more to aid the poor or ameliorate uh, inequality with government programs. It's, it's, you know, along with climate change and the issues around race, it's one of the most uh, polarizing issues that, that, that's in the United States. So that's interesting. Part of this conference was about post-COVID, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. how we are uh, need to reimagine uh, public policy in a place where when COVID took all the air out of the room for two years, now uh, new issues are evolving. And one question that came up on the uh, from the, the chat here was about the legacy of COVID in terms of the way 
uh, people react to work. Uh, people, uh, so, uh, and the question is phrased this way. There's a tendency now for employees to request working from home for three or more days per week for various reasons, work-life balance, mental health, uh, you know, reducing the inefficiencies of travel, uh, traveling back and forth. Um, however, I he hear a lot of feedback from employers that the salary range has already included some compensation for some of the, the issues that are raised. And therefore, employees should go back to work in person uh, or, um, except that maybe their salary should be uh, looked at differently. Uh, so what do you think? Is, is, do uh, people think about that? Uh, is, are there differences between Canada and the US in this problematic uh, generally of uh, uh, remote work? Uh, Bruce, you mentioned that as being one of the issue around the housing. Uh, you seem to uh, encourage or be encouraged by the possibility of, of remote work as being a solution to there are housing shortage. Do you want to start and then I'll go to Carol? Sure, sure. I, I think these issues are interesting and they do open up the question of leverage between employers and employees. And it's going to take a while for these to settle out. I think the um, every employer, every sector will have a slightly different or maybe a significantly different take on it. There are some sectors where um, the logistical and therefore the time and the expense involved in in-person office work um, is, uh, you know, is looked at in a different light now and, and businesses and employees will, will come to the conclusion they don't need as much of it because um, it didn't help their productivity or their quality of life. There will be, I think, other situations and it'll take a little while for these uh, to manifest where we see um, something lost in the lack of face-to-face uh, -face contact and collaboration. And I think, um, you know, to some degree, I, I think that's a bigger risk, especially among younger people who might be at the beginning of their career and not have the, um, the experiences and the value that you get from those experiences of working in close proximity to others. Uh, but I don't think we know how this story is going to end. Um, uh, because I think, uh, like with many things in COVID, we're still kind of tentative about whether it's over or it's not over, it's coming back or it's not coming back. And and uh, the employment scenario is just one part of that. Carol, any has that come up at all? Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I would just echo a lot of what Bruce said. It's very complicated. It's still ongoing. And, and it has an economic dimension for cities in the United States. The, there's there's just not as much economic activity, uh, even today, you know, with COVID supposedly winding down. Um, you, you know, I think one of, the, one, one of the aspects of this is the degree to which the remote work has kind of unleashed younger workers in other dimensions as well to sort of advocate for their rights and i think that's probably something to watch going forward too i think i think there's you know one of the things we're seeing in our data is is a real broad support among young people for labor unions labor unions have, have withered in the united states over the last 30 40 50 years i think i think one of the the effects of empowering younger workers might be to you know that the that labor unions get a second or, or whatever life in the United States, it's it's very interesting to watch. But I agree with Bruce. We're we're going to be studying the effects of COVID on things like workplace, schools, you know, healthcare more broadly, vaccine uptake for many years to come. On the uh, on the uh, part of what Carol's talking about reminded me of some data I saw yesterday in the U.S. It might have been Pew data. Uh, on whether Americans see the term capitalism as a positive or negative and socialism as a positive or negative. And I was struck by how different that is from Canada. Uh, in Canada, if you ask people now, would you consider yourself, do you think you'd be better off with capitalism or socialism if you could choose one of those two things? 60% um, of Canadians say socialism. And that number is eight points higher or more among people under 40. Um, and I think that, well, obviously, from what I saw in the U.S. data, that term has a much more highly charged and semi-toxic kind of uh, meaning in mainstream uh, public opinion. 
Uh, and capitalism, on the other hand, is kind of like uh, right after apple pie. Uh, but capitalism for a lot of people in Canada has been a, a, a kind of a conditional uh, thing, something that works well if we keep a close eye on it um, and can get out of control. Uh, and if we're not careful, can cause uh, negative repercussions. And so the whole kind of Wall Street uh, phenomena uh, and the idea of, of kind of letting business kind of have its reign, uh, which I think has uh, obviously some significant political appeal in, in the United States, it doesn't have the same appeal here. We don't necessarily see the rise in union uh, participation yet, but it's not hard to see that from where we are now in terms of uh, younger people in particular looking for more leverage in those conversations about the future. Yes, let's actually, it, we have several questions here coming up about uh, the voting and about our electoral systems here. So uh, let me just uh, go through some of them and try to put them together. Um, first of all, I think somebody, I was very surprised by the, the level of engagement uh, of voting in the US vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, I think, what we've seen in Canada more recently. And then um, one question is, uh, for both Canada and the US, to what extent might our different political system magnify differences rather than help build a consensus and coalitions? Uh, for example, in the US, the role of primaries, and in Canada, obviously, the first past the poll system by which a, a party can win <laughs> a uh, general election with only 35% uh, of the vote. And I think, uh, uh, let's start with Carol on, on this one and then uh, move to Bruce, which you both talked a little bit about uh, about this issue. Carol. Well, well, there's no question that, that the binary choice, two major parties uh, in the United States, it, it sort of, you know, fuels polarization, uh, partisan polarization. It's been a big factor there. You're, your team red or team blue, and that's it. And, uh, and so I think what you see among younger people in particular is a desire to, to say, well, what, what, why aren't there more alternatives to these two parties in the United States? Now, there are so many institutional impediments. Naturally, the Republican and Democratic parties don't mind having a monopoly on politics in the United States. So it, it's very hard to start a viable third party or fourth party or fifth party in the United States, a green party or whatever you, you do. And uh, and so it's difficult there on the, on the role of the primaries. I think what you've seen, it, it, it has had a, especially in the Republican party, what you saw in 2018 or 2022 was the fact that, that so many uh, controversial and Honestly, ill-equipped candidates were 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 came through the primary system. Again, Trump's role is is hard to hard to dismiss there in terms of choosing candidates, and many of them lost, and the Republicans paid the price for that. And uh, the primary system, it, you know, it attracts the hardcore, uh, especially of voters. These are the committed partisans, the most ideological voters, and so that distorts the candidates. That then the then the general election. Voters say, "Why are these? Why are these candidates so far apart? Why are they? Why are they?" It's because the primary system attracts the most ideological voters. Mm -hmm. So, Bruce, the first past the post. There's a question also about the role of third parties in uh, in Canada. Is the NDP responsible for the fact that two thirds of people uh, seem to be relatively progressive in Canada, Bruce? I, I look. I think more competition and different voices is better than less. And, you know, I think that progressive voters can sometimes look at the NDP and say, oh, the stronger the NDP is, the more likely we are to get a conservative government that does things that we really don't like. And, yes. you know, I think on the right, um, people saw what happened when the right was split. Uh, Jean Chrétien won three straight uh, elections. And mm -hmm. so, you can look at those kinds of scenarios and come to the conclusion that it would be better to go to a binary system. But on balance, I think it's actually better to have more vigorous competition, including possibly uh, looking at electoral reform um, as a way of making people feel as though they can choose ideas that are not on offer from the biggest tent parties. Mm -hmm. uh, 
while at the same time getting a government that more or less reflects their values, which takes you more towards more of a, co a permanent coalition uh, sort of scenario, which I don't know if we'll ever get there. I don't know how we would get there, but in terms of whether it would make people happier, it probably would make people happier. Um, I saw a question uh, that I just wanted to, to pull a thread on in the chat though, which is about financial corruption and somebody, so I think misinterpreted what I said about um, financial corruption. I was basically saying um, in the US, politicians need to raise money all the time to fund their campaigns. In Canada, they do not need money because they can't spend the money. So financial corruption being part of how politicians respond to entreaties uh, is a, in that sense, it's not theft. I'm not talking about theft. I'm talking about the uh, erosion of um, some of the more virtuous choices that politicians might make because of the need for money to compete in these extremely expensive contests. I think the last US presidential was an $8 billion exercise over the two or three years. You know, and you might ask as an $8 billion vetting exercise, how did it come down to those choices that, that were on offer? But that's a separate issue. I, I, I was saying in Canada, you don't have politicians wondering where they're gonna get that $100,000 plate dinner uh, organized and who's gonna bundle millions of dollars for them. Uh, I'm sure there is uh, financial corruption in a uh, in variety of things that government is involved in. There always has been, there always will be, and it needs to be rooted out. Uh, I wasn't talking about that. So I, I'm sorry to be uh, uh, bringing you back to, uh, to COVID uh, uh, again. I think there, there's a couple of questions here that, that lead us to think about the role that's, that government played, the increased role that government played during COVID, both in terms of giving subsidies uh, to different corporations, but also rolling out social, pro in Canada, rolling out the CERB uh, so quickly. And uh, how did that transform a little bit our receptivity to big ambitious social programs? Uh, should it, or, or did it, uh, it, will it be just linked to a, a moment in time linked to COVID? Like, didn't we learn something about the receptivity that that uh, the population has toward uh, government interventions? Let's start with Carol. I'd like to see what what's the the lesson. Yeah, it's, it's it's very it's very complicated in a way. But but you know the the Biden administration and even the Trump administration before it responded to the economic losses from COVID with really vigorous government response, government aid, stimulus packages. Um, I think that's all that's all done now with divided government in the United States. And I think the, the other aspect of this that politically, uh, while the inflate while inflation, you know, there are multiple causes for inflation uh, in you know, all over the the West, um, you know, the, the, the Republicans did blame during the during the political campaign a, a lot of the the government spending and the Fed policies, all, all you know, for inflation. And so, I think now that you have divided government, as I said, the the opportunity for anything big um, in the way of new government programs, I think, is is is, is just probably not going to happen over the next two years, at least. So I think no, there were, no long COVID there. Yes. What about you, Bruce? I think there are three or four effects that are uh, fairly profound from COVID. First of all, the, we stopped being a country that was really worried about the fiscal situation some years before COVID, probably not long after America seemed to stop caring about it. It was almost as though, you know, the voice of American conservatism was a voice of small government and lower taxes and less spending and small deficits and balanced budgets. And that was always kind of a, a good fit with uh, our kind of DNA as a country. We would, we would tend to be worried if deficits persisted over years and grew over years and there would be an autocorrect uh, in our politics. But that broke down. Uh, and I think it broke down because there was no more conversation about uh, balanced budgets anywhere in North America, really. Um, and when COVID happened, uh, we saw that there wasn't really a moment where there was a significant conversation about can we afford to buy the vaccines, 
numb the economic effects, stabilize the economy in all the ways. It was just accepted across all partisan lines that that's what we were going to do. The legacy of it is probably in part people believing that if you want it badly enough, turns out we can't afford it. So order the whole menu of uh, social agenda items going forward. And, you know, I don't know how that's going to turn out because interest rates are going up. So the cost of borrowing is going to be a bigger story, but the economy is also producing more revenues for government and the deficit's coming down pretty quickly. Um, so we may have a longer term influence of that. I do think that we saw in the response to serve the uh, income support measures for businesses and for uh, individuals generally a consensus that it's better for government to be in a position to do that and to do it quickly mm -hmm. rather than to get tied up in knots and partisan wrangling about it or wonder whether it's the right thing to do and that probably was the you know along with the sense of vaccines are probably going to be our friend in this and we should all try to take them we got to 90 percent uh, of adults uh getting uh, fully vaccinated um, those two things are the best examples of the collectivist instinct against my backdrop of saying there isn't as much of it as there used to be mm -hmm. and there's more pushback obviously on the vaccine side which reflects that kind of divisiveness that where if you sort of say, well, we should all try to do the same thing together because it's in our collective interest, there are more people who say, no, Bill Gates put that chip in you and uh, I don't want that chip. But still, uh, with 90% uh, uptake on the vaccines, uh, it's 10% uh, is less than 20% of the, the group that you described earlier being kind of a core uh, racist, anti, uh, anti the others uh, uh, wanting their they're you know seeing progress a social progress of the other as being uh, a threat to themselves um, i want to just uh try to end our our conversation here with just uh, some final reflections i i'm still not completely uh, uh uh convinced that there is not something uh, about the voting patterns. I mean, I, I think uh, I was struck by the fact that if people vote in the US and vote a lot, why aren't people voting in Canada? Why, or why aren't we seeing uh, the same engouement, the same, uh, uh, why are voting patterns uh, different? Is it just because we are more or less satisfied that things are okay the way they are, therefore uh, other people will will vote for me. Uh, Bruce, let's start with you. I was I was struck by the the that uh, that uh, way in which we the our our voting rates are just not as 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 high as they they used to be. They're um well they're variable. I mean, I, you know, for the last couple of decades, I think what I described um is you know, about a third uh vote and uh, their minds are already made up every election. A third don't vote and a third will vote, but they're flexible. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, that middle third are thinking they would, they might consider voting for not just two parties, but three uh, in some instances. So we have that flexible third. Um, mm -hmm. Turnouts will depend to some degree on whether people are angry or frustrated or whether they're hopeful or optimistic or what the nature of the campaign is and whether the weather's bad and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think our, our problem is so much a turnout one. I think it's that the people in the middle third that I described that they will vote, but don't know how. Mm -hmm. When we ask them questions about the knowledge testing questions, yeah. it's kind of shocking uh, what we find. Um, after six years of a gender balanced cabinet, mm -hmm only 30% of Canadians guess that 50% of the cabinet is female. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not like that's the only skill or knowledge testing question that matters. We asked how many people work in the banking sector and people say half of the adult population. There's like so many, uh, if you scratch at that, it just makes you depressed. Uh, so I don't do it as often as I might because I don't need to be a little bit more upset about the state of our democracy than I am. 
people uh, doing door to door and uh, people not knowing whether uh, Donald Trump is running in the riding <laughs> or not has been another element of seeing. So it's, it goes back to the, the weak literacy is, uh, on public policy issue that you've talked about. Uh, Carol, any thoughts on uh, what you see as the pattern of voting? Are you, I mean, people might say there were high turnout uh, because indeed, uh, people wanted to were engaged on the Trump versus uh, Biden uh, debate, but is that going? Is that a sustainable trend? And then well, we'll have to. Well, call I mean, it. what's happened with the partisan polarization is that is that the the two sides see each other as actively as kind of threatening, and, and so therefore, even if they don't particularly like their own candidates, they'll vote at higher levels to prevent the other side from, from uh, taking the government. So that's, that's you know, again, participation is up. Is that a good reason? Uh, it's, it makes you worried because then the stakes are so high, then you get some politicians like Trump after 2020 and the current Arizona governor's race where people just deny the results if they don't go yeah. their way. So um, I, I see that we are going to have to wrap it up. I want to thank you both so much for, uh, for doing uh, such a great uh, uh, survey <laughs> in, in so many ways of, of the way the, where the public is at. And thank you to our participant that asked some, some very good questions. And Nomi, uh, back to you. Well, thank you. Thank you to all of you, to Natalie for remarkable, wonderful moderating, and to Bruce and Carol um, for your in really interesting um, uh, yeah. presentations. Um, perhaps a little frightening, perhaps a little depressing, um, but there certainly were elements um, even in your presentations for, I think, optimism. And we're sort of ending um, this session the way we began the first day and um, with looking at is a glass half full, is a glass half empty, and how can we fill up the glass um, uh, better than, than uh, we have in past. It's clear from what you have told us that the road ahead um, is not going to be an easy one. Um, but I do think that um, Half the battle is knowing where we want to go. And I think, I hope that um, our institute this year has helped us at least begin that, uh, that journey. Um, but clearly you have reminded us that we have to bear in mind the realities um, that both of you have talked about so uh, eloquently. And we have to really figure out what strategies, what new strategies we have to um, used to get there. And um, you have inspired at least me to think about a whole next International Institute on Social Policy on those strategies. How do we get where we want to go given the realities of um, the polarities and, and, and the polarization and public attitudes and uh, et cetera. But I think that there are some elements in what you've described, it does not have to be a binary, um, either be optimistic or pessimistic, uh, but what are some elements that we have learned from um, going forward? So thank you to all three of you very, very much. You've really been um, made us all um, think quite profoundly about the current reality. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, since this is the last session of um, MQISP 2022, uh, I'd like to invite Carolyn. Oh, Carolyn's joined us. That's great, Carolyn. Um, so now we go into the last little bit of the Institute where we not only um, thank everyone who made this Institute a success, but also um, just do some final um, commentary. Um, over the last three weeks, we've been stimulated, we've been challenged to think differently about some long standing and some newer issues in a broad array of social policy domains. We have seen how interconnected all these policy issues are and how they impact different population groups and regions differently. We've been treated to excellent presentations, <coughs> excuse me, 
by 13 international speakers from the OECD, England, Sweden, the US, Ireland, Italy, and Belgium. <coughs> 15 Canadian speakers from all across the country and 13 moderators who gave graciously of their time and subject matter expertise to facilitate the sessions. And we've brought together over 2,700 registrants from all orders of government, the academy, NGOs, service providers, and students of public policy to think together about possible future directions to achieve a better Canada for all our residents. We couldn't have been able to do this without our mighty Monk Queens team. From Queens, Keith Panting, who many think of as Mr. Social Policy in Canada, who led QISP for 24 years. Margaret Biggs, our Sherpa and Taskmaster, who kept us on track and knows all things federal about social policy. And me, who worked with Keith for 21 of those years on QISP, bringing the provincial perspective to the conversation. From, from Dylan Tui and Ido Peng, who brought deep expertise in social policy to the table, fresh ideas and new energy to the team. We feel very, very confident in our U of T partners to carry on and lead the future of the Institute. And to the behind the scenes team of Daria Dumbadzi, Sarah Dopp, Adam Bell, Jillian Mathurian, Ariana Bradford, and Chris Cornish, who kept the administration of the Institute humming. We'd also like to thank our funders, Employment and Social Development Canada, and Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada for the international and Canadian experts to this public forum. Thank you too to the directors of the Monk School of Pol Public Affairs and Public Policy at U of T and the School of Policy Studies at Queen's University for making it possible for students and alumni of their MPA and MPP, MPP programs to participate. We hope you enjoyed the sessions as much as we did. Remember that they can all be viewed online at the Monk School's MQISP website and from me, à la prochaine, and now, Carolyn, over to you. Well, thank you, Naomi, and let me add just very briefly my thanks to Naomi's, to all the people whose efforts and contributions have been so key to the success of this institute. We'll be sending a survey to all participants, so please do respond and give us your feedback. I'd just like to offer a few very brief reflections on what we've learned over the course of this institute. Above all, I think the various presentations have underscored the importance of bringing data, evidence, and uh, analysis to bear on policy questions. And very often that evidence shows us that uh, things we thought we knew um, and that might be serving as premises for policy making, in fact, need to be rethought, debunked, or uh, more likely given further nuance. David Green, for example, showed us that precarious work is not on the increase in Canada, although it remains a persistent problem, that there has not been a great resignation of job quitting during COVID, and that there has not been an exodus of healthcare workers, although there have been shifts within the sector that may have eroded the front line. Rupa Banerjee showed us that Canada's express entry immigration program has responded to some problems while exacerbating others. Ido Peng and Laura Turkat showed us that the care economy is much larger and economically significant than most of us might have realized, and there are many more examples. I'd also like to return to some thoughts that I offered at the close of our in-person day on October 31st. I said then that we're observing two contesting narratives about contemporary policy challenges. One is a pessimistic narrative that traces the seemingly relentless rise of multiple crises, financial instability, climate change, geopolitical rivalry, loss of faith in democracy. 
But the other is an optimistic narrative that charts the course of human resourcefulness and inventiveness over the ages and projects that into a future of continuing progress in the improvement of the human condition. We've had an example of that contest of narratives in the session that just concluded in which Carol Doherty focused on the continuing majorities in public opinion, supportive of democracy, compromise and government responsibilities, while Bruce Anderson focused on the growing minorities with contrary views. Which of these narratives shapes our understanding of policy challenges and opportunities will determine how we respond to them. This institute has offered food for both narratives. Certainly, we've had ample evidence of the magnitude of the challenges in each sector we've explored and the intersections among them. But we've also had evidence of how societies learned under the pressure of the emergency of COVID that they could do things they thought they couldn't. Yeah. Employers learned, as Suzanne Briere pointed out, that accommodations for workers with special needs were not only feasible and affordable, but often productivity enhancing. Joseph Pagaris and Sarah Allen noted that healthcare providers learned that virtual care could be adopted on an unprecedented scale as a complement to in-person services. Various of our presenters showed us how new modes of interaction across and within sectors, government, private sector, community groups, academics, were rapidly assembled during the pandemic and might provide the seeds for new modes of governance in the future. In our in-person session, Baroness Shafiq offered a vision for designing social policies in ways that bring people together across social divisions and thereby strengthen the social fabric beyond the immediate effects of the policies themselves. None of this learning will stick without sustained attention. I think the cross-sectoral interest in this institute is an encouraging indicator of that attention. Not only have we had uh, about 2,700 registrations for these online seminars uh, as and our in-person day, as Naomi pointed out, but already the recordings of the sessions so far have been viewed by, uh, more than 450 times. I hope that in the future, this institute can contribute to that policy awareness as it has done in the past. For now, thank you for joining us. And as Naomi said, a la prochaine.